Hi everyone, thank you for coming down to tonight's event. I'm Zing from SG Innovate, and today we are very happy to collaborate with Entrepreneur First to bring you a topic close to our heart, how investors decide where to invest. At SG Innovate, we believe Singapore has the capabilities and resources to tackle hard problems from around the world. And part of our efforts includes knowledge sharing sessions like the one you are here for today. So without further ado, I'll hand over the mic to Didier, who will be our moderator for today. Didier, please. Thank you, Sajin. Thank you, everybody, for uh, spending some time here and coming over at uh, the SG Innovate office and the Entrepreneur First uh, office. Um, can I first ask who here in the room is an entrepreneur? Okay, cool. Who is an investor? Who considers starting up a company in the next uh, two years, next year? Okay, cool. Um, just a little bit of an uh, introduction of myself. So my name is uh, Didier. I am uh, an entrepreneur resident at Entrepreneur First. So we are helping highly ambitious and uh, talented individuals to kind of uh, start their uh, company uh, and go on a journey uh, with us. We uh, help them to pair up with a, with a, with a co-founder. Uh, and I'm helping with the teams um, just to make sure that they focus on building the most impactful thing that they can possibly uh, do. Um, EF is an investor, so we are a talent investor. Um, we got uh, the backed by the likes of uh, Reid Hoffman, a founder of LinkedIn, uh, Peter Thiel, Founders Fund. Um, we have about 80 portfolio companies here in Singapore. So we started uh, two years ago. Um, and we are like at the very, very early stage. So very uh, pre-seed and uh, heavily relying on uh, later stage uh, and our other early stage investors to follow on, uh, on us. So I'm super excited to kind of uh, invite my panelists here to kind of uh, dig a little bit deeper into how uh, the investors are making decisions because at the end of the day, they only invest in only a handful of carefully selected startups where they believe they can make like a kind of a huge uh, win uh, from, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work uh, that you as a founder, um, as an entrepreneur, not always get, get to see. So I'll try to kind of uh, scratch a little bit of surface and see uh, what uh, we can uh, learn today. Um, I'll leave it to the panel to briefly also introduce uh, themselves and how where they fit in here in the local um, yeah, ecosystem in terms of uh, their investor and investor thesis. Uh, Nickel? Thanks. Is this okay? uh, check, check. Hello everyone, my name is Nikhil. I'm a partner at Strive. Uh, we recently rebranded from a previous name, which was Gree Ventures, uh, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, we've been operating in the market for almost seven years now. Uh, we're a seed stage fund. Um, our latest fund is $130 million, uh, which we invest across Japan, Southeast Asia, and India. So we're a cross-border Asia fund. Um, which invests in the seed stage. Um, fairly agnostic in terms of sectors, but uh, tend to focus a lot on B2B, um, especially for the companies that we do in Singapore. Uh, we've been around for some time now on our third fund and uh, have been investing in Singaporean companies for, for uh, as long as we can remember. Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Christian Cadeo. I'm the managing partner for a accelerator called Big Idea Ventures. We focus specifically on the alternative protein space. What does that mean? It's focused on plant-based foods as well as clean meat. Our fund is based in Singapore, New York. Uh, we are pretty new. We actually just did our first close in March uh, with two institutional investors, Tyson and Tomasic, have come on. And we just made our first investment a couple months ago with a company called Shock Meat. You know, it was an EF company, actually. So we worked pretty closely with um, the EF team. And we are looking for companies. We're usually the first institutional check between friends and family. But the people who come in will have to have a minimum viable product, at least. Hey, I'm Aditya. I'm with uh, Elevate.vc. Uh, we invest, again, seed to Series A, uh, very early stage, usually. Uh, and we only look at deep tech companies and B2B focused. Uh, some of the key verticals that we look at include autonomous vehicles. In fact, that's our biggest vertical today. Uh, we've got uh, IoT and AI, we've got communications, and we've got a bit of med tech. Uh, typically, we only invest in, uh, in, in you know, verticals that we are fairly familiar with um, and you know, in areas that uh, me or the team have had strong operational experience in before. 
Hi everyone, my name is Victor and uh, I'm uh, with the Direct Investments team here at SG Innovate. Uh, SG Innovate is a deep tech uh, investor and ecosystem builder and uh, we have been here from the beginning um, uh, when it comes to the deep tech ecosystem. Uh, would love to share more later on when we have some time to chat. Well, thank you uh, panelists and thank you for also uh, sharing uh, here today with, uh, with the audience. Uh, as a first question, when you're really kind of starting your, your fund, um, you have an investment thesis, um, and then you get into the market looking for deals. You get like approached by a lot of very interesting opportunities. Sometimes, how does the thesis change over time, or does it change? Is it like yeah, your way to kind of keep yourself uh, uh, your focus? How you look upon it, Nickel? And. Uh, Thesis is to not lose money, <laughs> uh, like on a fund basis, but we can lose money on a deal basis. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, actually, we, we do have uh, some thesis, but I would say that the market here is not as mature and deep for us to have a very strong singular thesis on which we invest. Um, so I would say our thesis is more like a collection of micro theses. Um, so a collection of, at a given time, some three or four um, um, micro theses. And for example, one of them is that it's very difficult right now to build a company sitting out of the valley because the cost of hiring an engineer in the valley is is very high. Um, and that thesis has been played out in company. And, and you can build a very similar kind of company as long as you can get access to uh, the right kind of talent in another market. Um, and you can see that thesis playing out in a company like Zoom, which just went public. And I don't know how many of you know, but uh, Zoom has a lot of competitors in the market, you know, with Cisco and WebEx and so many others. But Zoom, um, if you compare the metrics that Zoom has versus other companies, you'll see that they spend almost half the amount of money that another US company spends on R&D. And is that because Zoom doesn't have good R&D? No, because Zoom actually has one of the best R&Ds. But the reason why they spend less money is because their R&D team is all sitting in China. Uh, where they're paying the engineers like one third or one fourth the salary of a US engineer, right? Um, and still getting quality access to talent, right? Access to quality talent. Um, so that's an example of a thesis where we try to invest in companies which have their cost base in Asia, mm -hmm. uh, but are serving the US global markets um, sitting out of here. So you can build a sales and marketing office in the US and serve the US customers, uh, but build all your R&D sitting in Singapore or sometimes even in Vietnam or India, etc. And that's an example of a micro thesis that we operate on, on which we build enterprise SaaS companies in that route. Uh, now, it's a bit foolish to build a consumer company that way, um, but you can definitely build an enterprise SaaS company that way. So that's, that's an example of a thesis, which I think starts uh, at some point, and we try to validate or invalidate that by investing in companies, mm -hmm. looking at signals from how the companies are performing and what we're seeing from the market. And based on that, we try to keep refining that thesis over time. Yeah. I think, like, Christine, you just did your first uh, close, so congrats on, uh, on that. Um, your pitch and is, like, very crisp. I focus on plant-based and then also clean meat. Um, do you see that kind of change over, over, over time? Uh, do you think, like, okay, this is, like, it helps us to focus in the, in, on deciding on, on, on the type of deals you want to do in the early days? How you see that going gonna to evolve, let's say, like, in, a, in, in two years, three years from now, and you can... Uh, so I think one of the benefit we have is our thesis is driven by a couple things. One of the primary one is d direction by our LPA agreement. So example, um, just to throw it out there, we can't take any startups that are focused on insect uh, because some of our LPs have structured or have conceptualized that insect is animals, right? So, um, so some of that thesis has to stay rigid within alternative protein. But you bring up a good point, you know, where we think eventually there's going to be some gray areas. Example, microallergy. Um, I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but it's just basically a one-cell organism. Is that animal? Uh, you know, it's debatable. But there's a lot of innovative stuff that's happening within that sector. And because it's not within plant-based or clean meat, do we accept that startup, right? Or example, I'll give you another example. We just had someone apply where they're actually making packaging goods, plant-based packaging goods that's basically 100% biodegradable. Again, it's not necessarily plant-based, it's not clean meat, 
but it serves an amazing purpose for us because imagine when all these applications, these food are coming out, if they're in plastic, it kind of defeats the purpose, right? So you need something that's biodegradable. So to answer your question, I think we're fortunate in the sense like a lot of our direction is driven by this overarching, which is alternative protein, as well as our LPA agreement. But it will change and mold. And I think there's going to be great companies, hopefully from this audience, that will help us or will make us think and say, hey, maybe we need to deviate a little bit. Thank you, Christian. Anybody wants to comment? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so here, as you innovate, uh, one of the key things that we were set up to do was to actually de develop the startup ecosystem around the, around deep tech. And if you think back about three years ago, this the word deep tech was not a word, right? So no one spoke about deep tech. You know, fast forward three years later, now uh, everyone wants to do some kind of deep tech. So I think I think um, that was one of the the main things we want to do to to show that there was a niche that could be filled in Singapore, um, and also that there were people and and companies. Uh, and funds that were able to do this particular area of work. Uh, as a fund, uh, our thesis is pretty simple. You know, we look at specific technologies. Uh, there are clusters that we, that we look at around mobility, around financial technology, around medical devices, and around IoT and industrial robotics that we like. That intersects with uh, our technology stack, which involves uh, AI, DLT, cybersecurity, and, and different forms of compute. So. We want to work in the clusters because we, we always believe that um, the use case and the application is more important than the technology uh, in, 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 our pers in, in our perspective because uh, you can have a technology that has no purpose, right? But if there's a use case for it, we can always figure out how to make it work better. And, uh, and as an investor, we can probably sell the company and make some money. So at the end of it, we want to be able to invest in great companies uh, because we want to be able to help the ecosystem, but we also want to make sure that as a fund and as, as investment professionals that we're able to see returns from the companies we invest in. Cool. Just one thing to add, I think, uh, you know, Nikhil raised a very good point about the maturity of the market, uh, you know, the maturity of deep tech here especially. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of funding available today, there's a fair amount of uh, liquidity, uh, but I think as, as ecosystems evolve, there's going to be a lot more maturity. And you know, if you look across to the West Coast, to, to Silicon Valley, there's a lot more focus on you know, very in, industry-specific uh, you know, venture capitalists and folks that you can raise money from. And uh, you know, I sincerely hope that that's the direction things go in. And uh, you know, obviously, we, we're fairly young as well. We started in November. And so we haven't had to change our thesis yet. <laughs> Cool. Um, when looking at actual uh, deals, like if there's a single parameter that is important to you uh, for you to make a decision whether or not that's worth pursuing, like what is the most important parameter? Um, well, of course, I think the answer for everyone here would be the founders, right, um, and the team essentially. Um, so for us, yeah, I think the team and how big is this market that sort of defines the level of interest that we'll have in the company. And after that, it's a bit more nitty gritties of like, you know, whether we think there's a problem over there that needs, that deserves to be solved, mm -hmm. uh, whether there's a right to win for this team, mm -hmm. right? So we can, we can, those are, I think, the slightly next level of questions that we'll always ask ourselves while evaluating a deal. But on a big picture level, I think almost every VC um, looks at basically those two big things, which is mm -hmm. how good is this founding team, and then how good, how big is this market. Um, the first one, because you're not going to achieve anything with a uh, subpar uh, founding team. Mm -hmm. But the second thing, actually, which is which is something that VCs have learned um, after investing a lot, is that you know a, a good founding team in a bad market can actually achieve nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so-so founding team in a very good market can actually achieve something. Mm. So the market is almost as important as as the founding team, which I think is uh, something that we try to keep. When well, you talk about founder, can you elaborate a little bit more what is a good founder? What are yeah. specific traits that you're looking for? Yeah, so actually three things uh, that we try to evaluate. Uh, the first one is um, sort of the what a lot of people call domain expertise, but for us it's more like founder market fit. Uh, whether we 
can believe that this founding team can actually build something in this particular market. It could be because of some unique insight that they have. It could be because they've worked themselves uh, mm -hmm. like decades within that market. So there are many reasons, but um, it comes in all sort of shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, there's there's no one way that we say okay this exactly defines founder market fit, uh, but usually it has to do with having spent some years working in that industry. Usually, um, the second one is very product oriented founders who are um, who have a, a very keen sense of customer success. Um, so they're looking at the customer talking to the customer a lot, and then f iterating on their product very quickly. Um, and both that capability as well as that affinity uh, towards the customer is the second one. Uh, the third one is, I think, uh, capability to go to market uh, with almost a maniacal sense of urgency. Um, and that, I think, is lacking in a lot of founding teams mm -hmm. when we look at them. That's where they end up sort of falling short uh, because they just are not either aggressive enough or feel that, you know, just building a product in the backyard is, like, enough and is going to get their company to, like, success just mm -hmm. by building the best product. Yeah. Yeah, so my industry is a little bit different because it's clearly more CapEx and OpEx intensive because you're building a tangible product, right? So I think for us, for founders, it's really two things. One is uh, you have a crystal clear vision of what you're trying to build. And look, food is building something. It is an application, right? And rightly, wrongly, you are myopically focused on that vision. And we really like that because that means that you put the research as well as your intensity behind it. Number two, just as important, is you have a roadmap of taking that MVP, uh, minimal viable product, because we don't accept ideas. That's where EF, they'll go to EF. Uh, after they go to EF, they have to have a minimum viable product. But that's just not enough. What we want to see from them is, and this is no pun intended, a recipe from that MVP all the way, how is it going to get on a store shelf? Look, and you, no one knows everything, and clearly you're not joining Accelerator because if, if you knew all that, you wouldn't join Accelerator, right? But we want to see how you map it out and understand it and how you would, be, you would tackle that. We're there to help. So if someone comes to us with those criteria, and you had mentioned, obviously, the other aspects, um, experience, yada, yada, but for us, we would add as an addendum was, are these two factors. You know, when we see entrepreneurs like that, um, it is something where, you know, our eyes light up. Um, I think because, one, I'll add one last point, is I think there's one thing interesting about our sector, which is because it's so nascent, as you know, uh, we, you're not going to have a bunch of food scientists that have the business acumen or entrepreneurship to actually go out and start a food tech company or an alternative protein company. That's the reality of it. But what you, what you will have are really amazing entrepreneurs who have a great idea and know how to basically assemble the pieces to get out an MVP, raise funding, and so forth. And I'll give you a broad kind of example here. So as mentioned, one of the examples uh, we invested in was Shock Me. Two amazing ladies from A-Star, awesome entrepreneurs, was in Y Combinator, was in EF. Um, but they, before that, if I remember correctly, didn't have that many startup or business experience. But they were able to su su successfully you know, raise, go through y EF, Y Combinator, and then they're where they are at. I'll give you another example. Uh, it's, a current, it's a company that we're currently looking at. It's two individuals. They have no food experience at all, but amazing pedigree. Uh, their bankers went to Ivy League, but they came up with an awesome MVP product, and they had a roadmap of how they're going to take it in terms of product release map, and it makes us interested, and we want to talk more to them. So that's for us personally. I'm glad I'm not lost, because I think these have been very good points. Uh, to me, one of the things that I always look for is, is some sort of a moat around the company, besides you know, just being very hungry and having a clear roadmap. I think uh, if there's no differentiator from a technology perspective or from a business perspective, it's going to be very difficult to, to stay ahead of the race, because uh, if you've got a good idea, everyone's going to come and copy it. Uh, and you know, fast. There's always going to be someone that's faster, smarter, hungrier than you are. So, you know, especially for deep tech, I think the big key differentiator for us, at least, is uh, to have a good solid moat of either technology or business around you. 
think they've said everything that's probably relevant. <laughs> but for, for, for Deep Tech, um, it's, it's a bit different. I mean, like, I would like to say the team is important. Um, um, and also the defensibility of the of the product, you know, as everyone has said, you know. And but for us, it's also what is the final go to market, and and how do I see the exit of the company? Because deep tech companies are very difficult to exit, right? Uh, you're not praying for an IPO. You're probably looking at M and A, right? And 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 how do we build how do we build a path towards the M and A? That's tough because you need to, to figure out relationships with, for example, in mobility with the OEMs, with the tier ones, you know, in in in, in food. Uh, okay, I'm not sure about foods. So I won't say food, but um, in 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 the areas of fintech, you know, who would buy like all the AML KYC uh, products that that we invest in, right? So that that exit strategy has to be very clear. So for us, one of the parameters, even at the seed stage when we invest, is how do we perceive the exit of the company? I mean, I can't I can't predict the future. But I would like to be able to at least draw a path to the future and, and, and then play from there. Right? So um, for us, exit is important. Uh, team, definitely you want a team that, my experience so far has been that uh, the teams that are more experienced, especially for deep tech people who have, been in, who have worked in the field, folks who have uh, crashed and burned with companies or at least with exited companies, uh, those guys move faster. Uh, it doesn't mean that that's the only formula to success. Uh, we've seen young companies that have created great ideas. Um, but it's a mix, right? Uh, but I think ultimately it's also the coachability and of, of an entrepreneur that's important. I, I always say this at events because the most stubborn and oxidated event, uh, uh, entrepreneur will not, will not be the best partner to have in a relationship with the VC. Because you want to be able to contribute to the, that's why they take your money, right? Because you are supposedly smart, smart money, right? And you are able to provide that path and, and share some insights. They don't have to listen to everything, but at least have a listen, right? So we've worked with entrepreneurs who are terribly stubborn, you know, worked out well, sometimes it doesn't work out so well, you know, but um, I think coachability is important. Uh, definitely a factor. Mm. Yeah. I think a bit related to that, like how long does it take for you to know like a kid that you're dealing with a good founder? Uh, how fast uh, are you mm. on it? They like, say, so, okay, this is uh, where we Typically, we at the pitch. <laughs> you can ask them a bunch of questions, the way they react, the way they respond. Uh, after doing it for a while, you kind of you kind of get a sense of, of how uh, defensive they are, you know. Like, oh no, no, no! But, but, but so it's 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 a uh, it's, it's a bit of gut feel. You can you can o almost always sense at, at at the outset a bit of that. Mm -hmm. Then as you start doing due diligence, as you start talking to them and, and getting to know the team a bit better, and as you drill down into some of the technology, then you realize, okay, you know, this guy is not so open to ideas, you know. And then and then you think, okay, what should I do next? Yeah. So. Um, Typically, it can be told from, from up front. Of course, there are some who are silent ninjas that you will only find out much later on in the process. <laughs> or when you're trying to figure out an exit, you know, uh, or, or secondary, uh, then, you know, yeah. So, the, so it depends. But I would say most of the time, if you've been doing this long enough, at the pitch and maybe the first few meetings, you can, you can roughly get a sense. How many meetings we're talking about? If you said, like, how many meetings would you need? I would say within the first or two meetings, first two meetings, you can probably get a sense. The first one usually is quite obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've sat down with uh, entrepreneurs uh, who, whom I can tell you within the first 10 minutes, okay, guys, this is not going to be someone we can invest in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody has stories like, okay, where you had a long kind of, where the founders really cultivating you for a few months? Or even like, okay, maybe a longer period just to eventually get you to commit? Or is it like mostly one, two meetings and okay? Yeah, actually, I mean, we have all kinds of stories of, of different kinds of founders which we have invested at what different times. Um, but I think there's a funny one that I was just probably sharing, just started sharing with you. There's a founder that, you know, we've been tracking and really loved the founder uh, the moment I met him. Um, was not super I was not super sold on the idea um, but the market seemed interesting so for us it was like check check right um, so then we were trying to dig in deeper and around roughly you know one month in into the process after having done two three meetings we decided okay this is not going to work out we're not sold on on the business in general and we we've been 
for the last four months, I've been trying to say no to this founder, <laughs> but have been not have not managed to do it. Uh, why? Because every time I I call him in, I really like the founder. It's a founder that I would rather work with, like on any other idea at some point in the future. So I I want to maintain that relationship, right? So I call him in. I can't I can't say a no on an email, okay? So I have to call him in, like you know, do the meeting, and every time he comes up with a new data point, which which takes me back, right? Like it's like oh we grew like 100% last month. I was like, what? <laughs> like here I was thinking that the business is not going to work out, but now you're growing like 100% on a month, right? Uh, or we just closed this big deal, which, which is going to give us this kind of revenue. Or we just cracked this thing in our product, which is, which is going to help us. And like for the last four months, every time I go in into the meeting thinking that I'm going to say no in this meeting, and I walk out thinking, man, like we need to liquid this deeper. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know where that will end. Um, and you know, for now, we are, we are still thinking what to do with it. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I mean, that's that's. I think uh, you know, I've been a founder before, and I know how hard it is to to be on that fundraising journey. Um, so I think f for the ones who really, really believe in the idea and feel that you know this can work out, I think there's definitely a fund waiting out there who will fit your fit your company. It's just about how persistent you are in your company, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, since we're, we're relatively new, but we're already getting applications. So, and I think the one tip, well, there's one gentleman who, the, the one word to describe him was persistent. Um, and it's a good thing. No, it's, maybe I'm the only one in this panel, but I actually like that is my mo, my MO is basically, look, you continue with, obviously you got to be tactful, but you continue following up until they either say yes, no, or they kill you with fire, right? So he was... And he was persistent in a very tactful way. So my recommendation, at least for us, is look, be persistent. WhatsApp me, ping me, email. I mean, within reason um, until, but do follow up because we're pretty, we make a decision relatively quick within our investment, uh, investment process is about a month to go in the cohort. So we make it relatively pretty quick, right? And we don't want to leave you know, great entrepreneurs hanging. So we'll make a decision relatively quickly. But if we don't, then you have every right to persist until we say yes or no. So uh, that's for us at least. I mean, I can't speak for the other guys. And I don't know whether there's too much to add here. I mean, there have been some founders where, you know, circles.life, for example, you know, they, they pitched me in a Kopitiam, and I gave them a check, you know, the first 30 seconds. Whereas, uh, you know, other founders, it takes a bit more time to, to really understand the market as well. Um, and especially in, you know, we're, we're all talking about deep tech. It's often, you know, two to three years pre-revenues before, you know, you really start to see strong market traction. Um, so, so sometimes bear with us is, is, you know, the only thing I would say because, uh, you know, we're learning as well because uh, a lot of the things that, you know, some of the coolest founders are doing are, are very new and are approaching very new markets. In terms of deal flow, is there enough deal flow here in the, the region? Is it, how, how have you seen that evolving in the, I mean, like two years ago there was no deep tech, um, but just like in general, is there a good... And is, and, and for is for deep tech or for everything else? I would say the overall deal flow in general for technology investments has definitely like blossomed over the past uh, five years, five, six years. I mean, if you think back six, seven years ago, this didn't exist. You know, when, when I first started about nine, ten years ago, it was boring as hell. You know, there was there were not many companies. Uh, it was a couple of Israeli guys. You know, it was a, it was a, it was just it was just a very sparse landscape. And then you fast forward to today, right? We have more than enough deal flow. There's definitely people chasing us for deals. You know, uh, we get we get introductions from other people. We have a lot of international deal flow coming in. So definitely, I would say overall deal flow up. Mm -hmm. uh, deep tech is fairly new. So three years. You know, I most people haven't figured out how to start a deep tech company yet. Which is why folks like EF, you know, have, have are here to help a lot of companies to do that. Um, I would say it's it's not enough. I would say there are companies in the space, uh, but they're not enough. Uh, most of them are fairly early. Um, a lot of the founders are reasonably inexperienced, especially in starting a deep tech company. Um, 
Uh, that's the current state of 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 deal flow for deep tech. Very honestly, right? Uh, we definitely see it improving over over the past two years, um, and and we look at international deal flow too, right? So so it's definitely uh, a bit bit richer coming from overseas, but but domestically we've seen the the kind of like the quality and the quantity come up. So the universities are producing quite a, quite a bit. In the next one or two years, you'll see even more because more more resources and I think more. Um, um, experience and knowledge are being recycled right into the ecosystem so that can only mean better things for deal flow yeah I'll speak because I mean I think you know if deep tech is new we weren't alternative protein hasn't even been born yet right so that's that's the reality of it but so I'll just give you some numbers so we, our accelerator we to start at least Singapore in terms of accepting application was um, starting in June, so really only a month, and domestically, I believe we have four applications currently right now, right? So, which is not too bad, considering it's a pretty nascent industry. So, but what we're seeing is, fortunately, our, our initial thesis was, we were a little bit, you know, Stuart Paul was a real concern was, do we need to do two things? Uh, one was to import deal flow from the U.S., because in the U.S., we're probably getting you know, we started in June, May, and we've had about 80 applications already, right? It's crazy. The activity, the nexus of alternative proteins is obviously happening in the U.S. Like 80 applications within two months is pretty insane. So we thought what we had to do was effectively import a lot of these deals where if they can't go to the New York hub, then we would give them an option to go to Singapore. So you either import it or effectively you build uh, what we call a studio model where effectively we're just kind of building different pieces, plugging it together. And as a studio, you literally make your own Frankenstein uh, startup and kind of roll it out, right? But the fortunate thing is that was a thesis and that was really what we were thinking. In actuality, you know, as mentioned, we got four from Singapore and then probably about 20 or 30 in Asia Pacific. So what we're seeing is we don't have to really export anything from the US or excuse me, import anything in the US. Uh, but what we're seeing is we're gonna have to definitely import a lot of deals that are in Asia Pacific uh, in totality. And the great thing about this is a couple things is People love going to Singapore just because of the ecosystem in general and tech, uh, the support infrastructure. So people have no qualms about actually relocating here from you know all over Asia Pacific, India, China, Hong Kong, because you know they don't mind living here. Number two, and this is quite important, maybe this is probably pertinent to deep tech as well, is uh, the Singapore government has been phenomenal in really supporting this industry. Like I'll give you an example. Yesterday we were in a round table purely focused on alternative protein that was led by A Star. EDB, and I'd say probably about 35 multinational companies. Like if you think about the biggest food companies in the world, they were, we were all there for one day, um, kind of hacking it out in terms of how Singapore can be at the forefront, meaning Singapore as a country can be the forefront of alternate protein. So rest assured that beyond the opportunity from a, uh, from a financial reward, you have an, a, an amazing government that's really supporting this nascent industry with all the right incentives. And I think that helps a lot. So uh, to answer your question, yes, deal flow is still shallow versus probably anyone else as example four, but we're quite bullish. I think we think in the next six months, a year with the right players across the board, we think it will grow quite nicely. In, in fact, I think, so I've, I've been an angel investor for a while now. Uh, I think we've just crossed that cusp where the market has matured enough that deal flow in deep tech has really grown. And, and that's, that's frankly the reason that you know, I've gone from being an angel to setting up a VC fund, just because there's more deal flow than I can manage on my own as, as an angel. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot happening. And you know, just, just, to, you know, just to reinforce the point that Christian made, I think, the, the next two deals that we're about to do, one, uh, you know, Seeds is helping us with, one, uh, SG Innovator is potentially going to go invest with us. So I think the levels of support that the Singapore government provides is, uh, is incomparable to any other place in the world. It's, you know, the, the way the Singapore government even rolls out um, regulations or, or makes regulations very clear, the way, uh, you know, uh, there are grants, there are all sorts of uh, great incentives, some excellent universities uh, in Singapore that I think a lot of uh, opportunities are being attracted inbound as well, uh, which, which, makes it, which makes our lives a lot easier. Do you feel that like you're at the point that you already have to compete for deals here in the region, or are you not there yet? I, I think um, 
I, I think there's so much differentiation in the sorts of uh, verticals that people look at. Uh, for example, I, I don't think I'd even know where to start looking at some of the deals that Christian looks at, <laughs> you know? Uh, and uh, so I haven't found too much competition yet, but uh, I can't remember who, but someone on this panel, you know, and I'd like to echo that. I think there's such a growing diversity of funds today in Singapore that, you know, you just, as a founder, you just have to find the one that's, that suits you, that you know, believes in you and that believes in the vertical that you are looking at and can help you along that track. Yeah, I think, so we've been around for some time here uh, and we've seen, you know, back in 2012 when we, we started investing, you know, we got into uh, Bukala Park in Indonesia, which is a unicorn now, and it was fairly easy <laughs> to get into these kind of deals, right? Excellent founders, like, growth, traction, everything. And, you know, at that time, a Series A check was a one million, we wrote a one million check at three million valuation in a unicorn company. Uh, so <laughs> it was way easier uh, to get into deals. I think it's highly competitive now. Um, there's a lot of funds around. Um, and thanks to, you know, the government and, you know, SG Innovate and SG Equity Scheme, uh, there are a lot of new funds which are empowered now with, uh, you know, the matching scheme, uh, which makes it pretty easy for anyone to compete for a million dollar sort of a check by just writing like two, three hundred K, mm -hmm. right? So even angels can potentially uh, start building micro funds and, and start competing. Mm -hmm. So definitely we see competition, great teams mm -hmm. and great uh, companies will always be competitive uh, in today's market. And those those companies will likely have like two, three term sheets coming to them. Mm -hmm. And at that time, that is when I think proving our value uh, for these companies is, is important, right? For them to choose us um, as, I think we're not at that point in the market where we have to sort of shove elbows and sort of kick people out. I think the market is still very, congenial so it would be like hey you know man like i really want to lead this okay like can and i really want to own like 10 percent okay so can you take like five and i take 10 <laughs> like hey, the market works like that right now uh versus saying like hey you know what like you are not allowed to touch this deal here's a competing like 15 percent term sheet which by the way is the common thing in you know india in in us and some of the more uh slightly more mature markets yeah I'll just, mine's really quick. Obviously, we're quite new, um, so I'm kind of kind of project our thesis, which is probably the best way to think about it. As you, as people out there who are potential entrepreneurs, is our thesis is really simple: is if you go into a supermarket now, whether it's cold storage, um, who else is there, NTUC, and so forth, our thesis is really simple: is every food item, every brand in there that's currently using animal protein will have an equivalent plant protein. And if you believe in that thesis, that white space is massive. And because it's so massive, I think in the, in the beginning, and maybe for the next couple of years is, hey, if someone else goes to someone else, that's great because we're trying to bring up this whole industry overall. So I'm speaking only on, uh, for, for deep tech itself. Um, I would definitely say there is some level of competition in terms of deals. Uh, uh, even though the space is, is the, the supply of companies is kind of low, but the number of investors who, 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 who do deep tech are also kind of small. It's increasing right now, but uh, it's still a pretty small number. And, not all, and, then, and there are no funds that are pure play deep tech funds in Singapore other than us. So we're the only ones that do pure play deep tech. So we, we have a pretty rich deal flow, but still, I would say that there are a lot of uh, competing funds that would uh, like to get into deals. I mean, we try to, to be as, as friendly as possible to most of the deals. Um, but at the heart of it, we, we, are, we also need to be sustainable as a fund, so we will need to make sure that we get good terms. Um, I, would, I think that's a good sign of, of where the market is going. Uh, of course, we, I hope it doesn't degenerate into a market where people are doing underhanded things to, to get to deals, right? Yeah, I've heard of uh, stories where people print out term sheets at, at demo days, right? And that, that, yeah, that's, that's really crazy, right? So, so printing out term sheets on demo day, not giving the founder time to think, take it or leave it. So, so there are such things coming in Singapore, right? And, you know, it's good to know. Uh, uh, those are not good practices, right? It's, yeah, but, but 
it, the fact that it's happening means that there are people competing for deals, right? Which is good for the companies because then you get better valuations. You know, hopefully you get better investors who are more savvy. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely feel there's competition. Cool. So when you're looking into a deal and you have a syndicate of other investors willing to join, how are you looking at that syndicate? Are you kind of sharing notes? Are you relying on the other VC to do some uh, bit of the due diligence as well? Or um, how is that uh, evolving? Or what's your experience with, uh, with that? Yeah, I think for us, it's always um, we like to lead. <laughs> so for us, it's like, OK, can we get to lead? Um, which uh, in most cases means like, um, that we have around 10% ownership minimum in the company. Uh, but after that, we actually talk to the founder and try and understand like what would be some of the strategic things that we'll need to do in the next 18 months, uh, which would be sort of the timeline that you'll use the money for, 18 to 24, depending on how early you are as a company. And in that case, we would we would sort of sit down and very frankly say, okay, you know what, like this and this aspect we can really help you with, but maybe together we should try to find like the other two aspects or the people that you're talking to right now like um, what all can they help us sort of check mark out of the five ten things that we feel we would need to do as a company together to 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 succeed right um, so we don't tap on to other funds to do sort of validation slash diligence for us um, we are pretty proud that you know we're as a fund we like to recruit people who come from strong domain expertise. So uh, I'm a computer engineer. My colleague is like a molecular biologist. Um, so we we are able to dig into sort of the deep, um, uh, even sometimes to the lines of course that they've written. Um, so we are fairly okay in terms of doing diligence and validation, but we do like to build syndicates which are going to support the company in the next in the next coming years. Uh, on our end, we, we have a team that has uh, experience and also um, uh, the right mix of uh, expertise in the various areas that we invest in. Uh, but we also work quite closely with partners and potential customers to understand uh, where the company stands in terms of market risk. So doing commercial due diligence with customers. Uh, for technology, uh, depending on who they're trying to sell to, you know, sometimes we work with um, folks from like GovTech, you know, to understand whether such technology applications really actually work for a government customer. You know, so, so we, we try to pull as many resources as we can within our own network and within the government network to make sure that uh, the company is legit. Um, for areas that we don't understand, you know, typically we work with a great co-investor that does understand, right? So we don't always have to lead our deals. We're happy to come in as a co-investor, um, and we would, but we definitely would like a, co a lead investor that understands what he's doing. So our, fi I mean, this is what we're planning. So when it actually happens, then we'll see if it deviates or it sticks to it. So the way our our fund is structured is you have to go into an accelerator. And within that accelerator, you got to spend five months. Um, obviously, on the five months, we're helping you, but also on our side, we're doing a deep due diligence within that five months. When you graduate from that uh, that five months, then we have a demo day. And when you find we don't, when you find a lead investor, because we don't lead, because obviously from compliance, we can't mark our own books. Um, when you find a lead, find a lead investor, then we become part of that syndicate because we won't lead on that. So. I think on ours, it's kind of a combination where we've already done that five-month due diligence because you have to go through that program. Um, and then on that second tranche of that fund, because there's three tranches to our $50 million fund, it's called Velocity, is where we'll invest up to three and a half million US dollars to the best companies that come out of that accelerator. But we won't lead, so therefore someone needs a lead and they need their due D, they do, the, do their DD, and then we just look from evaluation if it makes sense, whatever that price round is as well. How deep are you guys uh, going into doing the technical due diligence? I mean, in the early days, it's all about storytelling, kind of having that kind of uh, vision. Uh, but we, you want to, at the end, also, especially deep tech, avoid uh, Terranos situations. Um, so how, yeah, what, what are you doing to avoid that you're making a bet on somebody who is an amazing visionary storyteller but fails to kind of eventually get the technicalities in? <clears throat> So, so for us, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have a very strong panel of advisors, uh, especially in, in, you know, we're, we're very focused on the four verticals because that's what we know and understand. And uh, we have a, you know, we get in the experts as and when needed. Um, 
you know, a bit of a mix and match to your last question. So one of the deals where we didn't lead, uh, the, the deal was led by Ford Motors. And they had a very strong panel of technical experts that went in and, uh, you know, did all the technical DD alongside us, mm -hmm. uh, which, which really helped. And, you know, they clearly had more insights than we did. Uh, we did have additional experts just to, to satisfy ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, those are the sorts of partnerships we do like to, to build. Any else want to add? I think we are slightly different. Um, so I, as I said, I think we try to have like some innate capabilities within the fund managers to sort of evaluate the founders. Uh, most of the times these days we are investing in pre-launch companies um, and we're giving them a million dollars uh, to go and execute the product, right? And sometimes there's, there's some product uh, validation already and then we'll just take a quick look at the product if it's built but in most of the deep tech cases especially um, the product is not out yet and you know maybe there's somebody who's using some part of it or using an AI model uh, which will then be transformed into a product so we have to usually judge just the capabilities of the founder which we are able to do by having a like one-to-one -one conversation in terms of how do you imagine building your product what is your tech stack going to look like? You know, I can ask a backend engineer here, like, hey, what's your stack? Mm -hmm. And that itself will tell me, like, what's your level of maturity mm -hmm. in terms of, like, capabilities, right? Um, so we judge, because the thing is that at seed stage, like, we are processing around 2,000 companies in a year. Uh, I don't have time to go and look into every line of code that everyone is writing. Our process is, like, overall, you know, four weeks, to do the whole validation. Um, so we don't have time to, to spend time. <laughs> uh, we would rather just give like two, 300K as part of a 500K round if we think that the risk is too high, but we still like the founder and then move on uh, to sort of other work and then keep in touch with the founder and help support them. And sure, we can make mistakes, but I hope we don't make end up making like Theranos kind of mistakes. Um, and even if we do end up making that mistake, then at least we should realize that within a year uh, after spending that time with that founder that, hey, there's something wrong. Uh, and there's no KPI that is coming to us or there's no real uh, feedback from the market that we are getting to mix, uh, to give us the confidence that this company is really true and really legit. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that we'll make mistake in our career, um, but we should just learn from that mistake, cut it over there, and like just cut our ties with that kind of a company. Yeah. So, so I think one thing which I'm definitely more enjoyable than all of you guys is my DD is I eat the stuff, right? <laughs> so, no, I literally have. Like I remember, I literally eat it, or I give it to my kids, and they eat it, and they try it. Um, like, no, we literally, I had an entrepreneur, amazing, amazing lady um, in Southeast Asia. She sent me uh, her milk made from sesame seed, right? So I tried it on my kids, and it was actually fantastic as well. Or I had these two really strong entrepreneurs who were using jackfruit to make um, dumplings. Or conversely, there was a third example. Um, I kind of lost, lost my thought. Was this... Was this great individual who was making, uh, using from superfood to actually make these shakes, right? And so it's pretty interesting. It's, it is a little, it's obviously quite different. That's why I love this industry because it's super fun and it's super nice because you actually get to try something that's tangible where you're just actually trying it out and you know if it's good or it sucks, right? So that's kind of great. Uh, but that's the plant-based side, which is a, because where it's a lot more tangible because the plant-based side is stuff that you can commercialize right now. Um, the other side, which is clean meat, and maybe for the audience, you know, everyone here is probably in deep tech, so you know it is, but if you don't, um, the clean meat side is basically using cellular properties from animals, extracting it, putting a medium to it, and actually growing meat in the lab. That one is a lot more theoretical, right? Because a lot of, example, shock meat, you know, it costs them for three dumplings, $5,000 to do three dumplings. So you can't really be sitting there eating their dumplings. You'd make them go bankrupt, right? So. On that side, we really go to what you are doing. You do as well as we do have a panel of advisors. Um, my experience was I was at one of the first alternative protein unicorns, so then had that experience, and then uh, someone on my team was at deep food experience and big food experience, right? So we go through the usual DDs on that side, which is probably similar to deep tech. Cool. 
I'm going to move over to some questions of uh, the, uh, the audience. Um, the first question that I have here, do you look at who the other investors are on the cap table before making a decision to invest? Is it a key consideration? Uh, we're seed investors, so like usually we're the first institutional investor, um, so that usually is not a criteria, um, but if the company has actually raised money, then we definitely look at like who's the one who's put in the money and what is the caliber. Um, and we usually also, you know, get on a phone call with that with that uh, fund or with that angel and try and understand like what their thoughts were and also just get some feedback on the company. Yeah. We're the first, usually institution check, so no, it doesn't matter to us. Yeah, ditto. <laughs> um, so we do everything from seed all the way to around series B. Uh, so yes, it does matter who is in, on the cap table. Uh, for domestic, for companies in Singapore, uh, we want to make sure that um, having a more credible list of people in the, in the cap table speaks a, a, a bit, quite a bit for the company, right? So that's one factor. It's not the only factor, but it's a factor, right? Uh, and also understanding how you diluted a company previously is important to us. Uh, for international deals, especially those in America, right now because of like CFIUS and all these money laundering uh, rules, you know, we want to make sure there's not too much Chinese or Russian money <laughs> in, in the funds because then there's an issue in, in when you come to when you want to exit your company, right? So yes, the cap table is important uh, in any consideration. Cool. Uh, another one: when you meet with founder after you invest, what kind of results or news you want the most, good or bad news? So you invested in a company. So uh, when you're following up and you have the meetings with the, with the founder, what do you want to hear the most? Good or the bad news? Uh, the truth. I think VCs are pretty hardened people. Like, I mean, in a portfolio of you know, 10 companies, eight will be struggling and two will automatically be growing, right? And the two which are really growing, the founders will not have time for VCs, and <laughs> they'll be busy growing their company. The the other eight will be the ones who would be, you know, coming in and saying, "Oh, you know what? Like this is not working out, or that is not working out, or my I have this co-founder issue, and things like that." And at that time, like that is where I think VCs can help, right? And and help fix some of those problems, or at least give some advice based on our experience. So usually, we end up hearing bad news. Um, face to face, and then emails of great news. <laughs> cool. Frankly, I, I like to hear bad news because uh, you, you know, good news is always good. <laughs> but uh, if there's ways you can help, or you know, get your network to help the companies that you've invested in, I think that's the real value add of of a VC to any startup today. Um, we have Just some, to add on uh, one last thing, so it's the thing, only thing that I want to hear is some news, because there are companies that you invest in, you have information rights that do not update you, right? So that happens. Uh, you, it doesn't mean that the company is doing badly. Sometimes they just have no time to respond to you because they're so busy. They have so many deals on hand, you know. But yes, some news is always is always what we need. Yeah, totally agree. I think like one of the very easy things for founders to do is just write a mail every at the end of the month giving an update of how your month was, right? Like it's the easiest thing to do, but somehow founders feel it's the hardest thing to do. Um, but I think if you can inculcate that capability right now, there's almost um, 80, 90% chance that when you raise your next round, you're gonna have your previous investors coming in and saying, hey, this founder actually kept me updated on their company and okay, I'll put some more money because they know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, question from a robotics uh, company. What is the minimum or what do you look for in uh, when investing in a robotic hardware company? We don't do hardware, so. Uh, Victor, just. Okay. We, so we haven't done, any, we have done some robotic hardware, yes. Uh, what was the question again? Yeah, what do you look for? What is uh, the minimum you need from a Wow. Uh, if it's at the, typically, uh, we don't do early stage for hardware, especially when it comes to robotics. Um, I would need to see a clear use case. We've seen cleaning robots, painting robots, you know. 
the defensibility has to be very clear. The market sizing has to be very clear. You tell me you're going to do like, uh, like a painting robot that's meant for China. And you know, I think, okay, the cost of labor in China is cheap. You know, you're going to do a robot for China, which costs more. That, uh, it doesn't make sense. Right? So, so offhand, that's what... So if it's, if it's too obvious an idea, you know, like, uh, it, it may be a bit tough to justify. Um, uh, I would say uh, we've seen robotics from everything from acupuncture <laughs> to needling. You know, all the way to painting of, of huge, like, vets, right? So, uh, wow. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, the reason why we say no is always a, a bit of gut feel and a bit of understanding the market. It's the same question as uh, market sizing, you know, and, and whether it makes sense or not. Yeah, and sometimes the team, right? There, there are a lot of crazy... Uh, somehow the robotics, robotics companies uh, seem to come with a bit of crazy with them. You know? So it's, it's, uh, it's been interesting to see, but, but it's fun, right? I've seen... Uh, We've seen robotic arms, right? It's like so. It's interesting because till today there are still companies trying to do robotic arms, right? Which is which is extremely commoditized, right? It's, you can change the arm, you can change the joint, you can change whatever, you can do a lot of different things. And, but there are still people trying to to innovate on top of the robotic arm, right? So so if someone comes to, to me with an idea like that, so my point is like, how do you differentiate yourself? You know the moat, you know, and how much money you need to get to 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 to, to the market, right? And yeah, it's yeah, robotics has been a tough one. Are there any questions from uh, the audience? I want to open it up for a few more. Um, just a question. Obviously, you want all your investments to be home runs, but what would be a good result in terms of your hit rate? Like, how many? Would you look for out of your investments? How many percent would you know you you look to succeed? How many would break even, and how many would fail? What would be a good result for you? Anyone else want to go first? <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm happy to answer that. I think you know you always hope that, like you said, everyone is a home run. Uh, I think if you look at the uh, top quartile VCs that have done exceptionally well. About 30% or 33% have done uh, you know, extremely well, 33% have done okay, and 33% have failed uh, across the globe. And again, this is top decile, I think. Yeah, I think um, we do our fund sort of risk management slightly differently. Uh, we try to create a sh smaller portfolio and uh, take a bit more concentrated risk. Um, so we prefer and expect our companies to do, on an average, much better in the industry. And that has, uh, that sort of theory, fund management theory has been, um, has evolved over the last seven years for us. Um, our first fund, we invested in nine companies in the market, and you know five of them have already given us exits. One is a unicorn, one sold for 100 bucks to grab. Um, so we see that the fund management theories in Asia work slightly differently right now, partly going back to sort of my very early comment that the level of depth of maturity is still um, quite behind the US market and definitely behind like Indian and Chinese market. Um, so I personally, I feel that this market is about capturing talent um, and the companies that are able to bring talent on board to, to their company um, are likely to succeed more. So they are very, f in the end, there will be fewer companies who will succeed. And I would better create a concentrated portfolio of companies that I feel will be able to absorb the best talent in the market. So we expect at least half of our companies to do very well. Um, and that has been the case so far. Um, and then, of course, there will be some moonshots out of those, and we are hoping. Um, and that would make or break the overall returns of our fund. Yeah. So I think ours is because we're, we're, we're spreading our bets across. I mean, we're writing these kind of micro checks of 125,000 US. So over, over four years, we'll probably have investment into between 80 and 100 companies. So that mitigates a lot of that risk in terms of a concentrated bet, right? Uh, not saying it's the ideal way, it's just how our accelerator runs. I think the way we've modeled it is, look, there's gonna be, there's gonna be a sizable chunk that just go bankrupt. Um, but there's also gonna be a sizable chunk that what we call are basically zombie companies. They're not, they can't raise, they don't die, unfortunately, no matter how much you want them to, they just sit there, right? 
And then we're going to have those small home runs, let's be honest. I mean, food is an interesting category outside of beyond. So we'll see if that uh, could be a trend. But there will be a small, which will be really big home runs. Um, but I think where we think the biggest return and the biggest chunk is, and this is really where I'm speaking this, and hopefully this appeals to people here to be entrepreneurs, is we really actually think in this sector, the exit cycle is going to be a lot quicker than tech. And you guys will be flabbergasted why I said that, right? Let me t explain why. If you think about the big food companies, Monolith, Unilever, P&G, et cetera, Kraft, yada, yada, what do they have? They have a lot of marketing muscle. They have a lot of distribution muscle. They have a lot of retail muscle. They have a lot of um, supply ingredient muscle. But what they really need and what they really want is innovation, right? And frankly, you know, if you've worked in a big company, innovation is tough, right? So where where the innovation is going to come from is really amazing entrepreneurs, right? It may be two women, you know, living in Jerong or something, come up with a great formulation. And, you know, in two or three years, they don't need to actually have massive revenue. As long as that application is fantastic, the big food company, they have all that muscle, marketing, distribution, ingredient, manufacturing. What they want is that IP and that application. So I think that's why really where... Initially, where a lot of people, and I know I'm going off a tangent, so I apologize, is where there's a little hesitation where people are like, oh, it's food, it's, you have to build something fan, uh, tangible, there's regulatory, yada, 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 I don't know anything about food. But then I give the upside is, hey, the reality is you don't really need to take your company that far. If you get great, a great IP, great product, and you're showing a little bit of attraction, these food companies are hungry for buying brands because they're not growing. They're growing maybe, I don't know, two, three hundred basis point, which is like two or three percent per year. So they need brands and they know that if you don't, if you buy it right at the inflection point, uh, if you, pa if you let them pass that inflection point, they'll become another beyond or impossible. And at that point it's too expensive. So to answer your question, that's how we kind of model it out. Can I ask a question? What's more important to you, one or the other? And please don't say both. If, if you, someone presented to you with a commercial argument but didn't have the technical expertise, or someone with a com technical expertise that didn't have the commercial, which one would you go for? Uh, in this market, the one with technical, uh, because commercial is easier to find in the market. Yeah, I'm the reverse, actually. So we are, someone has a commercial idea, um, but doesn't necessarily have the technical. I, I would go with technically, for, but for a slightly different reason. Uh, I find a lot of the companies that we look at uh, are valuable to be bought out because of their technology, as opposed to how quickly they can scale revenues. And I would go the other way, which is uh, commercial over technical. <laughs> because we've seen a lot of technology and a lot of technical ability, but not being able to translate that into commercial activities because, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, you know, to actually bring something to market, especially for deep tech. So for deep tech specifically, you know, technology is great, but show me the market uh, and, and then maybe we'll put some money. Last one over there. Hi, Chang from Cryptify. Um, we are currently trying to raise our pre-seed um, from angels. I'm wondering whether there is a cap in terms of percentage of um, equity um, that is owned by the angel that would you know, put you guys off in the next, um, perhaps, seed and series A and so on, funding rounds. Short answer, around 20%. Um, but maybe if we really want to discuss that, and just come offline afterwards and we can go into details. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming here and spending uh, the evening with us. Uh, can I get a big applause for the panelists? <laughs> so thank you all for, uh, for joining the... Everything's recorded as well, so you're able to kind of uh, uh, see it uh, later and share it later. Awesome.